All right. Well, it is great to see all of you. Thank you very much for being here this morning. And honestly, um, when all this hit yesterday, I, I literally got the phone call while I was in the middle of prayer and preparing, you know, going over my notes and getting everything put in order like God had already given me, um, you know, what I was supposed to teach on. And I was really excited about it. I'm still really excited about it. And then I get this phone call that I got to rush up and grab my daughter and, you know, uh, get her to the hospital and she's not doing good, vomiting and stuff, had to leave work. But anyway, it was quite the day. And I thought, you know what? I recognize this. I recognize the enemy. I recognize what he's trying to do. Um, and I just, I don't accept it. And um, I really appreciate that I've got a family of believers here that are willing to come together to stand in prayer, to war against the enemy, because that's what it takes. That is what it takes, is all of us standing together. Where two or more are gathered together, there he is in our midst. And um, a three-strand uh, cord is not easily broken. And as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. It takes all of us. It takes all of us. And I am your family, and you are my family. We are all in the family of of God, right? We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And I'm telling you, the word says that no weapon formed against us will prosper. And anything that the enemy takes, he will have to repay sevenfold. So he better get ready to pay. He's going to pay. He owes, he owes us. You know what I mean? He owes us. So, all right, the title for this morning's message may sound like a middle school girl titled it, um, no offense to middle school girls, believe me, I've had middle school girls, no offense, as well. But um, the title is Best Friends Forever. Yeah. Best Friends Forever. You know, and, and maybe, maybe middle school girls, maybe, the, maybe they're on to something. I don't know. But when I think about best friends forever, I can't help but think about my best friend, Jesus. We better pray. Because I'm about to take off. So, hmm. Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to be best friends forever. Amen. All right, so, if you think about best friends, if you've ever been married, you think about your spouse. No one knows you like your spouse. Or no one should know you like your spouse, at least. And if you're not, you think about the best friends that you had in school or that you do have in school, whatever. And all of those are great relationships, but they only know you to a certain extent. They only know you to a certain extent. Now, if you get married... Generally, in the marriage vows, you say, till death do you part, right? And you're like, this is my best friend. I love this person. They're amazing. They're awesome. They're never going to not be awesome. I'll gladly vow till death do you part. And, and believe me, I'm going to stick to my word. I'm going to stick to my word. I'm, we're right there. Unfortunately... According to WFLawyers.com, 44 states reported, and among those 44 states that reported to the CDC, they reported their, their divorce rates in their states, and approximately 50% of all marriages will end in divorce or separation. 
Is that upholding the vow of being your best friend forever till death do you part? It's not. And I'm not coming down on anyone that's, that's been divorced. That's not what this is about. But 41% of first marriages end in divorce, according to those 44 states. By the way, we are the sixth um, in the ranking among the world. The U.S. is the sixth in the ranking among, among the world of divorce rates. So there are still five that divorce more than we do, apparently. 60% of second marriages end in divorce, and 73% of third marriages end in divorce. Notice how that number goes up. Once you start giving in and you start quitting, it's easier and easier and easier. Some people do probably need to be divorced. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not saying that they don't. Like you guys know, um, I was on the verge of being divorced at one point in time as well. But that till death do you part, that best friend forever, is what I want to drive home. We have a best friend forever that won't end in divorce. That loves us inside and out. Knows our deepest thoughts. Knows our deepest gross things that are in you that you don't want anybody to know about, especially your spouse. But nobody. You know, you don't want anybody to know about it. He knows about it, just so you know. Your best friend, he actually knows about it. And he still chose you. He still cares about you. He still wants to be with you. So, I'm going to have three points today, and I'm going to hit uh, several verses like I always do. But if you want, most of where we're going to be is in John, the book of John. So you can definitely open up to there if you'd like. My first point and if you are taking notes, you can write it down, is I see you. My first point is I see you. So in John, chapter 1, verse 43, it starts out, and this is Jesus <clears throat> calling his disciples. John chapter 1, verse 43 the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip then went and found his brother Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about him in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel replies, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, Philip said. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel asked, How do you know me? And Jesus' answer is profound. Jesus says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus says, You believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. Then he added, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus answers him and says, I saw you. What's so amazing about this is no one was around, Nathaniel. There's no way anybody could see him unless it was God himself. Whatever he was going through, whatever he was processing, there's no way anybody could know what was in his heart. Man judges outwardly the outward um, things that people do. 
but God judges from the heart. God judges us from our heart. Nathaniel's response here, there, if you've ever seen the show The Chosen, there's a phenomenal scene in there about this. And it, it just, it gets right down into my heart, you know? Like whenever I was watching, I just started crying because I can internalize that. I can picture myself there. I can picture him seeing me in my place of being alone, in my place of crying out to him and calling out to him, needing him to meet me there. I need to know that he sees me. You need to know that he sees you right where you are, in your hard times, in your good times, every time. He sees you. He knows you. He sees you. Do you believe that he sees you too? If you just take this question at surface level, it's easy to say, yeah. But what about the times whenever you question? What about the times when you feel alone? When you feel like he doesn't see you? When you feel like nobody sees you? Nobody understands? Nobody gets what you're going through? The fact is, he does know. And he doesn't leave you. And he does understand. He does know what you're going through. He does see you. He sees you right where you are, especially in your time of need. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords, of all lords. He's the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the great I am. He sees you. And he wants you to see him too. I'd like to ask you to do something for me. <clears throat> I want you to close your eyes and ask him to reveal a time to you when he has seen you. If you're listening to this and you're driving in a car somewhere, don't close your eyes. Um, but seriously, ask him to reveal a time where he has seen you, where he wants you to know that he saw you, but you didn't feel like he saw you at that time. He loves you. And he does see you. All right. If God revealed something to you at that time, please either make a mental note of it if you can remember things easily. If not, write it down. If you don't have something to write on, save it in your phone because. He wants you to know that. And that's very important. If the God of all creation that created the world wants you to know something and he spoke to you there and revealed something to your heart, that's important. That's very important. Make a note of it. And remember to go back and thank him for it. Enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving. Be sure and thank him for it. Point number two is I care about you. I care about you. And I personally care about you, but I want you to understand that this is God speaking to you. These are the points that he gave me to speak to you as his mouthpiece. He's saying, I care about you. Those are his words to you to penetrate your heart, to penetrate your soul. That's what he's saying to you. I care about you. And let me prove it to you. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 28. Matthew 10, verse 28. 
This is Jesus speaking. I love this. He says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, if you look into, into this, Jesus is not saying be afraid of like, oh, oh my goodness. He's saying revere, have reverence, have honor, have respect for the one that can do this. That's what that means. He doesn't want you to be afraid of him. He wants you to honor and respect him. Respect him as God of the universe. He says, and here's, here's the great point that I want to get to, that Jesus says. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. Your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. I know what you're thinking. Uh-huh. Laugh it up. Doesn't take much. Count mine. I get it. But he says, even the numbers, the very hair of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I would venture to say every sparrow because he didn't create them in his likeness. He didn't create them in his image. But he did create you in his image and he did create you in his likeness. Jesus didn't come to save all the sparrows. He came to save you. To take your sin and your shame. That's why he came. How much more important are you than the sparrows? He says, there's not one that falls that your father doesn't know about, that he doesn't care about, but he cares so much more for you. This is out of the words of Jesus' mouth, who is in the father, and the father is in him. They are one. So he's telling us, I know how much the father cares about you because he cares just as much for you as I do. And I came to lay down my life for you. I care about you. He cares about you, is what Jesus is saying here. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. He says that because he's our advocate. He sits, at the right, or sits and stands at the right hand of the Father, advocating on our behalf. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. He doesn't say that because he wants to disown us. He says, whoever disowns me. If you disown me first, then you will be disowned. You will get your wish. If you choose, it's a choice that you can have. He's not saying, I want that. He's saying, you have that option. He also doesn't want us to take that option. And if you think about it, because there will be people that argue that point, that he's this, this tyrannical ruler. He just wants to, you know, be hateful and hurt people and all that kind of stuff. No, absolutely not. It's the exact opposite of that. The exact opposite of that. Would somebody that doesn't care about you lay down their life for you? be tortured and tormented and crucified for you? Absolutely not. Of course they wouldn't. But would somebody that loves you do that? Yeah. He's called our father for a reason. If I could right now snap my fingers and trade places with my daughter, would I do it? Absolutely. In a heartbeat. She's going to be fine. But even if she was on her deathbed, and she wasn't going to make it through the night, would I still trade places with her right now? Yes, absolutely. In a heartbeat. He's called our Father, our good, good Father. Because that's exactly what He did for us. Because He cares about us. 
He told me to tell you, I care about you. And then he lays it out here. Not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. <laughs> uh, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You are worth far more. Jesse likes to say that Jesus has a picture of him in his wallet. If he had a wallet, yes, your picture would be there right after mine. He says the first one, he knew what was coming. He knew what was coming. Uh, imagine how big that wallet would have to be. You remember those little, uh, according to his would keep going. It's like, wow. Wow. You know, and whoever was looking to see if theirs was first, it would be the first one. And then the next person's looking, oh, theirs is the first one. You know? I love that. <clears throat> this, this next um, passage that I'm going to read, uh, boy, it, I've read it so many times, but every time, it just it stands out so much. And I hope that it stands out to you too. If it hasn't before, it's going to after today. We're going to turn to Luke Chapter 7, starting in verse 36. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Let's think about just this for a second. Sorry, I wasn't planning on doing this, but let's think about this. At this point, Jesus has already been ridiculed by all the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day. And one of them invites him to come to his house. Jesus knows the thoughts of people. He knows the thoughts of man. He could tell people what was in their, in their mind, in their heart. And he still went. And he went to prove a point. And the point is right here. I love it. We get to look into the mind of Christ. We get this hindsight 2020 vision, right? This Pharisee didn't know what was up. He was trying to catch Jesus in a trap. He, he thought that he was smarter than Jesus, the guy that made him. You know what I mean? Like, and mind-blowing. I, you know, I feel for this guy. I hope he learned something from this. But, so he, he invites Jesus over. They go over. They recline at the table. And it says a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. This woman who lived a sinful life. She came there to the Pharisee's house. She got into the house, even. She wouldn't be allowed in the house. She gets into the house anyway. Gets in there anyway. Because she was determined. And she brought this alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. I want you guys to process every single bit of this story. Not story. Historical account. I want you to process all of this. This woman is there standing behind Jesus because she didn't feel worthy to be in front of him. She's standing behind him. She's weeping because she knows she's a sinful woman. And she knows that he's the only one that can, that can make it right. No one else. She's felt this probably all her life, or at least all of her adult life at this point, 
felt unworthy, ashamed of what she's done. Does that sound familiar? Have any of you ever felt like that? Like nothing can clean, cleanse you but Jesus. But Jesus can. Here she is, and she's weeping. And she wets his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them, his feet. She kissed his feet and then poured perfume on them. Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to everybody, no. He said to himself, listen to this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. He says to himself these things. If this guy was a prophet. (laughs) And then the prophet answers his thoughts. Jesus answered him. (laughs) Whoops. This happens a lot. Jesus does this a lot. It cracks me up. I love that he does this. So then he answers them, Simon, I have something to tell you. Keep in mind, he just said this to himself. Tell me. Tell me. Teacher, he says, calls him a teacher. And then Jesus starts talking. He says, two people owned money, owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replies, keep in mind, Simon's the religious leader, not Simon who turns to Peter. This is the Pharisee. Well, I suppose, in all of my wisdom and knowledge... Uh, that part I'm, I'm just adding in there. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Well, that's pretty clear, right? You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon. He turns to her who's weeping, loving on Jesus, Cleansing his feet, pouring perfume on his feet. A priceless gift. Turns to her and says to him, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head. But she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, So he was talking to Simon. He was also speaking these things out loud so she could hear them and she could receive them for herself because she needed them. Jesus does this a lot. He says things to other people so that other people will benefit. The whole Bible is Jesus saying things and God the Father saying things to other people so that we will benefit from it. The same thing that he's doing here. I love his tactics. But he says, he's he's talking to, he's looking at her, but talking to Simon. 
and to her. Then he says specifically to her, in everybody else's hearing, your sins are forgiven. Did she ask for forgiveness? Is that recorded in here that we know of? Maybe she did, but it's not recorded in here. What is recorded is her unconditional love for Jesus and her trust and her faith in him. And because of that, she was forgiven. That is what, what caused him to forgive her. He sees her heart. He sees your heart. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? They're probably thinking, Who's this guy that thinks he can forgive sins? Then Jesus said to the woman, So he had just said, Your sins are forgiven. The very next words that come out of his mouth are, Your faith has saved you, go in peace. You can now go in peace. You came in distraught. You came in devastated because of the things that you've done in your life, knowing that you couldn't help yourself, knowing that the wages of sin is death. That's a clear understanding. I think everybody that lives in sin understands the wages of this is death. There is separation because they don't feel the presence of God. If they haven't been forgiven by Him, they don't feel that presence from Him until He comes in and He meets with you. He says, your faith saved you. Go in peace. I want to point something else out. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. But it doesn't record anywhere that she went and made sacrifices, that she went into the temple most likely because of my presumption from the way that the, uh, the Pharisee treated her and was thinking of her and talking about her and stuff. He's like, Jesus shouldn't even let him touch her, or let her touch him, right? This, from what we can tell, this is the only action that she took. And Jesus forgave her and told her, go in peace. You can have peace. We can have peace. God gives us peace. And he says... I care about you. He says, I care about you. Your sins are forgiven. You have, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now I want you guys to think about a time where you knew that God cared about you. I had asked you to think about a time where he, you knew that he saw you. Now I want you to think about a time where you knew that he cared about you for whatever reason it is. Yours is going to be different than mine, I'm sure, and that's okay. Think about a time in your mind where you knew God cared about you. Maybe it was that very first time where you realized the, the magnitude of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Think about a time where you knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that he cared about you. Mine, if you're wondering, is a time where I was, I was at one of my deepest, darkest places. It was a time right after Brittany was rightfully about to go divorce me. It was right after that. And I'm still hearing her praying for me, speaking scripture over me in the mornings and stuff. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. This woman, you know. And I've told you before that she had asked me, have you been spending time with God? 
are you spending time with God? And I'm like, yeah. No, I wasn't. But at this point, God was, he was speaking to my heart. He was trying to get in there, into that hard heart. And he did speak to me. He did soften me. And I thought, you know what? Yes, I'm going to. I'm going to, I'm going to set time aside. So I told God, I remember exactly where I was standing in our old dining room. And I literally pointed on the back porch in our sunroom to a chair back there. And I said, I'll meet you there at 645 in the morning. And that was it. And then I set my alarm to be there at 645. And when I got there at 645, he met me there. He was there. He was there. He met me there. That was him telling me, I care about you. You want to set time aside for me? You better believe I'm going to be there with you. If you're there, I'm going to be there. And he hasn't left since. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That was several years ago, but man, I remember it like it was yesterday. Point number three. If you are taking notes, you can write it down. God said, I want to be with you forever. I want to be with you forever. That's where I came up with the name Best Friends Forever. So you're like, does God really want to be with me forever? Yes, he does. Let's prove it. Let's go to John. Back to John. This time we're going to jump into John 17, the best chapter in the Bible. To me. John chapter 17, verse 20. One of my absolute favorite verses. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. So this, let me preface this. This is Jesus praying to the Father in the hearing of his disciples. Before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, where they come and take Jesus away. This is after the Last Supper. He had just washed the disciples' feet, all this stuff. He's getting ready to go to the garden. He knows what's up. And it says that he looks into heaven and starts praying to the Father. This is Jesus praying to the Father, and we get to hear what he says. My prayer is not for them alone, talking about the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So, like I've told you before, this is him praying for us, me and you. So as you're hearing these words, these are the words that Jesus spoke about you. Jesus spoke these words about you. This is for you. It's literally his words for you. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Then in 17, verse 24, so a couple verses later, he says, Father... And this is where I'm proving it. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Point proven. Jesus wants you to be with him in his glory in heaven forever. That's what he's telling you. That's what he's telling me. He wants us. He says, I want to be with you forever. His words. <laughs> John 14, a couple chapters back. John 14, verses 2 through 3. He tells us, keep in mind, I want them to be with me forever. Then right here, he's telling his disciples, 
I'm going there to prepare a place for you. He says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? So he wants us to be with him forever. He's literally telling us he's going to prepare that place for us. We don't have to make it when we get there. It's going to be ready. The one that knows you intimately inside and out, all of your thoughts, all of your desires, the desires of your heart, he knows you. So if you want this amazing cabin up in the mountains or something, I don't know. I don't know exactly what that New Jerusalem is going to look like, but it's ginormous if you've ever read the dimensions. It's like, what? And there's a place there that has your name on it. You got a mailbox there with your name on it. He made it for you. Your greatest desire. He made it for you. He made it. I venture to say that when we get there, it's going to be better than anything our minds could possibly comprehend. Because my mind can't comprehend how the human body creates another human body in it. My mind can't possibly comprehend how the eyeball works, but it works. You know, if I tried to think of that, it wouldn't be anywhere close to that. I draw stick figures, guys. Like, he makes everything. (laughs) Think about how awesome this place is going to be. I'm going there to prepare a place for you because I want you to be with me forever. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. (laughs) This, does this not get you fired up? Like we're only going to be here for a little bit. Whether it's good or bad while you're here, you got somewhere good that you're going. You got something to look forward to, right? (laughs) How awesome is that? Luke 23, 39 through 43. This is pretty incredible, and it should give us a ton of hope. Luke 23, 39 through 43. Today you will be with me in paradise. So one of the criminals who hung there, Jesus is on the cross. These things have already happened. He's been at the garden. He's been whipped. He's been beaten. He's been tortured, tormented. He's stripped naked. His flesh is ripped off his body. He's hanging on a cross with two other criminals. Two other criminals. They hurled insults at him. One says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. I don't think you're going to get saved if you're running your mouth, dude. Like, what? You're dying, he's dying, and you're still running your mouth? Oh my goodness. See, this is why God didn't make me God, he just made me me. That dude, I, I mean the audacity. Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. He says, looks over at him. Don't you fear God? Like, he's thinking, even this guy's like, what is your problem? Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? You're, You're sitting there on the cross too, dude. Like, what in the world? Now, they didn't get beat like he did. Not even close. But they're going to die. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We're punished justly. We deserve to be up here. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He humbled himself. He humbled himself, recognized 
that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that the God of the universe is hanging on a cross next to him, and he still humbled himself and asked him to remember him. He knew what was up. How did he know what was up? This man lived a life of crime. He recognized the difference. He recognized who he is, and he recognized who Jesus is. And he humbled himself. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him. Jesus answered a criminal that lived a life of crime and was dying, being punished. Who, who the guy said himself admitted, I deserve this. I deserve what I'm getting. Jesus answered this man who didn't do one single thing that we know of to be a holy, righteous person, but he's hanging on a cross for his sins that he self-proclaims deserves. He knows he deserves it. That's who Jesus is looking at and speaking to here. Jesus takes the time to lift himself up with nails in his hands and in his feet, has been shredded, takes the time and the energy, the effort to lift himself up, to get enough breath to be able to speak to this man and say to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Is that not love unconditional? It's one thing to think that they're chilling, sitting back at a, at a table, eating and drinking and having a good time, and Jesus looks over and says it. It's a whole other thing when you picture what's truly happening here. It was excruciating pain just to lift yourself up to breathe, let alone speak. And he says to this sinner, I'm doing this for you. And I want you to be with me. I see you. And I want you to be with me. And because you've recognized me, because you've believed that I am the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, because you've recognized that, you've humbled yourself, you will be with me today in paradise. You are answering my prayer. Because my Father God has given you to me, and I want you to be with me in paradise. I want you to be with me forever, and I'm going to prepare a place. I'm going to have to make yours quick, because you're going to be with me today. Are you wrapping your head around this? Whatever you've done, He still wants to forgive you. He wants you to be with him forever. It's okay. He will go through the most excruciating pain in the world that could ever be inflicted on a human being all for you. No matter how bad you've been, no matter what you've done, even if you feel like, well, yeah, but I've been a Christian. I've been a Christian my whole life. And I just, I just stumbled. I just fell. I just, I just sinned against. I just put him back on the cross. No, you didn't. He went there once. He paid for it the one time. He already paid for it. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to be this sinner on the, on the cross dying that knows that you're a sinner. He wants you to recognize it, but he wants you to recognize that he's the only answer. That you will only be saved through him. He wants you to forgive yourself because he's forgiven you. He's forgiven you. <laughs> he's forgiven me. A righteous person falls down seven times and gets back up. Get back up. That's all. Get back up. Repent, apologize, and go on with your life. Just like you do with your own children. Like your own children. When they apologize and they repent, you're quick to forgive because you love them because they're yours and you're his. Isn't that great with our kids? Our kids look like us. They are like us. Believe it or not, they're like you. Like it or not, they're like you. <laughs> and we're like him. So if we're like him and they're like us, they're like him. 
Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus truly wants to be with us forever. Me, he wants to be with me forever. You, he wants to be with you forever. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. My question to you is this. Do you want to be with him too? It's super simple. It's super simple. The answer should be obvious, but it's not obvious to everybody. Some won't be with him. If we were all going to be with him, he wouldn't have had to ask the Father. He wouldn't tell the Father, come into agreement with the Father, that he wants the ones that the Father gave him to be with him. Not everybody will be. But if you want to be, you can be and you will be. I love it. I love him. He's so awesome. If you haven't made a decision to allow Jesus to be your all in all, I want to tell you, you hear these, you hear these um, evangelists and stuff, and, and they just tell you all the, the bright, shiny, good, fun things. It's not all roses. It's a free gift, but it costs everything. Everything. You do have to give up your own life and take his. But he says, my burden's easy. It's light. And it's short. It's short-lived, you know? Then we step from glory to glory. So if you do want that, I don't want you to be misinformed. He says, in this life, you will have troubles. You'll have trials and tribulations. But you can take heart because I've overcome the world. You can go through anything because I've overcome the world. He says, all things work together for the good of those who love me. He doesn't say all good things work together for the good. He says all things, good, bad, and different. If you let him, they'll all work together for the good of those who love him. Even the bad things, even the hard things, even the things you don't understand, you can't wrap your mind around. Even those things, he's going to work together for his good and for your good to bring him glory. I love it. It's amazing. So, if you want that free gift and you haven't accepted it, come up. We'll, we'll pray with you. We'll talk you through it. We'll help you to understand what that looks like. If you're online, feel free to give us a call up here at the church. Jump on an email. Send an email. We're at Church on the Rock in Harrisonville. If you don't want to come here and you're online... Go somewhere that's a Bible-believing and teaching church. You don't have to come here to find him. He's everywhere. But if you are here today and you want to receive him, definitely come up. Don't leave today without it. It's the best thing you'll ever do, ever, in your whole life, for the rest of eternity. We're going to play some music, worship again, and uh, you can come up while we're worshiping. You can come up after we're worshiping. Um, if you want prayer for healing or... Um, anything else, it doesn't matter. If you want God to speak with you, touch you, whatever, come up and uh, we'll lay hands on you, anoint you with oil and, and uh, do that. If you have kids here that are in, in children's church, don't go home without them. Uh, who knows where they'll end up, you know what I mean? But, uh, and they're yours. They're your responsibility. They're not ours. So we've got our own responsibilities, okay? All right, I love you guys.